We have been talking about the Holy Spirit. Welcome again, those of you who are visiting with us and those online. But we, 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 you know, we have said that the Holy Spirit was a promise of Jesus to the church. We also have studied that the Holy Spirit is a producer of action. If you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to work. It, it, there's no way that you can contain the Holy Spirit. All right? We also said that he is the contact that leads us to Christ. He is the power that we will need even more manifested at the end, the end of time. We also have said that to be filled with him, with the Holy Spirit, we must first be cleansed of self. You need to get out of the way. We also have learned that the Holy Spirit empowers us to stand for truth. And because of his constant manifestation and supervision and provision in our lives, we have learned that we should be thanking the Holy Spirit as much as we thank Jesus. And I know that it's hard to say amen to that, but remember, they are all God. One is not better God than the other. Amen? So the Holy Spirit should be thanked, should be recognized, and, and should be included in our prayer life by name. We also have learned that the Holy Spirit will help us with our temperaments. <laughs> and that through the, fruit of, the fruits of the Spirit, He is going to help us manage, manage our personalities. We also have learned that the Holy Spirit will help us and guide us, actually, to the, to the choice of mate that we make. Some of us could have used that help years back. Don't say amen. <laughs> we also have learned that the Holy Spirit, if we use his standards, if we use his standards, he will guide us into the right relationships. The Holy Spirit helps us understand marriage as a spiritual relationship. It helps us, uh, you know, it, 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 and help us use those spiritual principles in that marriage relationship. We also have learned that the Holy Spirit is the one that helps us rear our children. Children that are crippled by our DNA. Folks, us parents, no parent can rear a child without the help of the Holy Spirit. Can I hear the parents say amen? amen. And only Christ can strengthen us out and help us with that. We also have learned that the Holy Spirit is the one who helps us write our story, our life story to the glory of God. We spoke about Ananias and Sapphira, and we learned that their sin was really not greed for money, but just not listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. We also learned that we must think victoriously, huh, like the Holy Spirit. And then last Sabbath, we learned that division amongst God's people is resolved by God in a very simple way. By calling upon those very same complainers to get involved in the work of God. I'll say amen for you. Amen. Today, I want to actually talk about the life of the first Christian martyr. His name was Stephen. Now, from the get-go, I am fully aware that it is not good to dwell on negatives. Because to do so, in many cases, it gives glory. But having admitted that, I'm going to declare that God can get a lot of glory out of your trouble if you learn to see your trouble through his eyes. Trouble in the Christian life is not of itself bad. 
you know, I remember I was talking to my father when he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. They were going to do the surgery. And he told me something that his doctor told him in Puerto Rico. He told my father, you know, I have observed that the difference between people who get cancer is simply not how they got it, but how they handled it. Did you get that? It is not how the trouble comes. It is how you handle it when it comes. And the issue I wanted to address this Sabbath is that for the majority of people, whenever something bad happens to them, the first thing out of their mouth is, why did God allow that? Or why is God punishing me with this way? So for my unbelieving father to tell me something like that, it gave me a different perspective. The difference in trouble, because all people have trouble. Let's point that out. Let, let's be clear about this. Good and bad people have trouble. But the difference between good and bad people is not the trouble. It's how they handle the trouble when it comes. Amen? Now, I, I, need, I need all of you, you know, here and watching you know, you can take this to the bank. I'm not going to say you can bet on it because we don't bet. At least we shouldn't. I'll leave that there. There's no escape from trouble on planet Earth. But the question is, do you see Jesus through the stones of your life? And in these 10 days of prayer have been actually an inspiration for this sermon. Because based on your prayers, based on what's going on, I have the feeling that our congregation is under siege. We are under attack by the devil. Particularly sickness, trusting in God. And the increase in trouble seems to coincide with us Choosing to, 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 you know, preach about the whole book of Daniel. Huh? Then the whole book of Revelation. Did you notice that? How the trouble began? And then the assault has increased as we continue to move into the series led by the Spirit. And it looks like, you know, again, forgive me for my, you know, for what I'm going to say. It looks like all hell has broken loose in this fuse. More people sick, more deaths. And many of you sitting here and watching online, you have multiple, you have lost multiple loved ones. There's a lot of pain in these pews and at home. And all of this is happening almost simultaneously as we said, let's seek for the latter rain. And we cannot ignore that. We cannot ignore the fact that as, when you try to get busy and closer to God, oh, the devil is going to just throw everything but the kitchen sink at you. Surgeries. And just stuff out of the blue. And should I then remind you that the devil is also a studier of Scripture. Let me prove it to you from the book of James. James chapter 2 and verse 19. Just write it down. and then. But I need you to actually read this with me. It says this. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons what? And they do what? You see, the devils do more than some of us do. They believe and they also tremble. We believe and keep on doing what we're doing. Where's the, where's the amen? Where's the amen, Lord? You, you see, the devils believe and tremble. They know that God will do exactly what he said he's going to do. There's no question in their mind because, remember, they got thrown out of heaven. 
So the devils do not take God for granted. So having studied the word of, of God, they know that Jesus himself, their former captain, made the Holy Spirit a central part of his preaching ministry. Let me show you what I'm talking about. John 14 and verse 16. John 14 and verse 16, this is what the Bible says. It says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another what? Or comforter. That he may abide with you for how long? Now Christ taught that. Jesus taught this. He made this a part of his preaching ministry. And I'm going to give you another comforter or helper. So Jesus made the Holy Spirit and the coming of the Holy Spirit. He bridged that event into the next phase of the church. John 16, number 7. Write it down. John 16, number 7. Jesus said this. Nevertheless, I'll tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the helper will not, what? Come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. See, the text, this text is even more exacting. Because the text is pretty clear. Jesus says, I have to get out of the way. You know, it's interesting how they, the three of them respect each other. They don't try to occupy each other's space. I must move on so that he can come. Because Christ has chosen as God to limit himself in human form. It, 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 granted, he has not lost his omnipresence. He, had, he, he has he, he's chosen not to use his omnipresence. He decided to retain human nature in human form. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. And on doing this, because he loves us so much, he wants to permanently identify himself with us. And to make sure that all of his, uh, all, all of his presence might be felt all the time, everywhere, with everyone, and any situation. And let me get, uh, let me get out of the way in this cumbered or restrained form, and let him who is limitless in form come and take my place. Then in Acts chapter 1, our, our theme text, Jesus says he's going to come and he's going to give you power. So Jesus teaches clearly that the Holy Spirit is a necessity. What word did I say? A necessity. And this is basic. We have to have the Holy Spirit. Folks, we will not survive in these last days without the Holy Spirit. Your brain, let me put it this way, your brain cannot take the stones the devil is going to throw at you. The devil will knock your, will knock your brains out with his stones. So you need the Holy Spirit to help you maintain basic <laughs> sanity in these last days. You know, the book Acts of the Apostles lists a number of blessings that immediately affected the Christian church as the result of Pentecost. As the result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And this is the list that the book lists when, when the Holy Spirit came. Number one. It says that the news of the Savior was spread throughout the entire Roman Empire. The great spreading of the gospel began. Number two, as the message was preached, it changed hearts with the Holy Spirit. Folks, people could not just sit and listen. They had to do something. Remember when, when, when Peter preached and they asked him, what must I do? Huh? They were pricked in the heart. Number three, converts came from everywhere. Everywhere. I mean, this gospel took off. Number four, backsliders were being converted. 
People that left the ways of God said, you know what, I got it, I got it, I got to come back. And we have experienced that here. People that did not want to know anything about Jesus are saying, you know what, these are not normal days. I need to connect to the vine. Amen? Amen. Number five, sinners united with believers. Then number six, some of the bitters, bitterest uh, you know, opponents of Jesus became followers. We're going to talk about one of them called Saul. All right? Number seven, Christians look at one another as Christ would have. That came from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Folks, th that's the big difference that we have here. If you think that you're better than somebody else because of your knowledge, you're in the wrong place. We are sinners, receiving sinners, and loving them as they are. My knowledge is not going to take me anywhere. The Pharisees knew the whole Pentateuch verbatim, and they crucified the Son of God. Do not equate knowledge with salvation. I got to love you. As I expect Jesus to love me. Now notice I didn't say perfection. Do you understand that nobody actually knows the definition of perfection? They don't have a clue. The only one perfect is God. I'm going to leave that there. That's in two sermons. Number eight. The church became single-minded. Single-minded. Single-minded to reflect Jesus. And when we get there, we will be a different church. When, every, when everybody at the movement decides, today I want to be like Jesus. And we come to church to be like Jesus. And we stand in our marriages to be like Jesus. And we decide at work to be like Jesus. We deal with our children the way Jesus would deal with them. When that becomes our ultimate goal, oh, watch out. Number nine, the church grew to itself gifted people like Stephen. People who became proclaimers of the word of grace. And number 10, when the Pentecost came at, you know, to the church uh, in, in, in Acts chapter 2, the church had courage bigger than the devil's intimidation. Now let me remind you that whatever blessings came to them at Pentecost, it is just a foreshadowing of the power we shall receive in the last days. You see, it's in the book of Acts. You just, you just got to read it. It's there. We're going to do more. You see, when you read the amazing combination of power that came to the early church through, through that one outpouring, that's just peanuts. That's a foretaste. A sample of the power that shall come to the church when we get last day power. Whatever they did, we're going to do more. Whatever they felt, we're going to feel more. Whatever they were, we shall be more. So the books of the apostles in page 55, it tells us, but, but near the close of earth's harvest, a special bestowal of, of spiritual grace is promised to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. So let me say this with all the love that I have for every single one of you. I believe that Satan is trying to distract his church, God's church, from focusing on prayers for the Holy Spirit. And he's doing this by getting us to focus our prayers on let me be healed. Let me pay the rent. Let me pay the mortgage. Hell, 
heal my aching heart. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I mean, granted, those are good prayers. They're good prayers. But they are not priority prayers for last day people. Because if we have the Holy Spirit, he will take care of the rest of those things that we are praying for. Folks, I need you to listen to me today. The devil wants to turn your prayers back into the same old begging litany that has crippled us all of our lives. I'm telling you, I'm in this theme of victory. This theme, I, I need you to... People tell me, Mario, why are you always, you know, live with that kind of victory attitude? Because of this. I'm showing you what I'm doing every single day. And he's, do but, but, by the way, the devil is, is doing it to get us off praying for the one essential thing. We need power from on high. So I say to, the, you know, to anybody here in the congregation who is struggling with a life-threatening illness, don't worry about praying for healing of the illness. Pray for the Holy Spirit. That will take care of the illness. I'm serious about what I'm saying. Don't get on your knees tonight and worry God about your bills. Don't pray, Lord, my wallet is empty. Say, Lord, my heart is empty. My soul is empty. He will fill your soul and then take care of your wallet. Can I get a witness? Oh, this is serious, folks. The devil is trying to distract us and get us back to that old litany. Not one prayer should be prayed in your home. Not one prayer should be prayed in your life for your life that does not include give me the Holy Spirit. Fill me with power. Because if you don't, the stones of life that the devil throws at you are going to knock you out. We're told in the book Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers in page uh, 174, we're told that this promised blessing, if claimed by what? If claimed by what? <laughs> Will bring all other blessings in its train. <laughs> okay, you stay quiet. Hallelujah! How's your faith this morning? And it's giving liberally to the people of God. Free. Folks, don't get on your knees and ask for a house and clothes and stuff. Start with the Holy Spirit. Ask for it. Lord, I need the Holy Spirit. I need him in my life. See, what, what, what we're talking about is it, extremely important for us to actually live this, get this mindset. Not just important, but it is critical. You see, the final days of earth's history are cataclysmic. I'm not trying to get all educational on you with big words. All I'm, well, all I'm trying to say is that the last days are going to be rough. Cataclysmic. I'm sorry. All right. And we're familiar with, with, the, with the great, um, the graphic language that Jesus gave us, right? We know these phrases. Matthew 24, wars and rumors of wars. Nations shall rise against nation. And we're seeing these signs all around us, aren't we? And we are seeing it. Just try any news outlet. Your favorite one. Famines. And pestilences. We're currently living through a pestilence. We call it pandemic. And folks, let me put it this way. I am fully convinced that one of these pestilences, not just COVID, in the last days, is cancer. You know, people laughed at Ellen White when she wrote back in the 1800s that cancer was caused by a germ. They laughed at her. Guess what? 
They're not laughing anymore. More and more, they are coming to, um, to the understanding that we are born with cancer in us and the lifestyle and the DNA and the environment will either activate or not activate the cancer. Famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places, Matthew 24. Deliver you up to be afflicted, Matthew 24. Betray one another, Matthew 24. Hate one another, Matthew 24. Iniquity shall abound, Matthew 24. And all of this, Jesus is talking. Love shall wax cold in the last days, Matthew 24. As of the days of Noah's were, so shall the, day, shall, shall the days be in the, uh, from the coming of the Son of Man, Matthew 24. Huh? Distress of nations, Luke 21. Seeing the waves roaring, Luke 21. Men's heart failing them for fear. Have you heard about mental health? Luke 21. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. Tornadoes, hurricanes, Luke 21. And this is the language of Jesus describing the world we're living and here's the issue. We have gotten so psyched out by the ordinariness, is that a word? Yeah, ordinariness of tragedy that we, the ones that are awaiting the coming of the Son of Man, do not even pay attention anymore. If there's a mass shooting, we talk about it for a week and then nothing. If there's a hurricane, like, you know, we experienced a Category 5 in Puerto Rico, hey, let's cover it for a week, then nothing. Earthquakes, tornadoes, fires, floods, wars and rumors of wars. We don't even, we don't even look up to the TV anymore. We have become anesthetized, you know. We have become immunized to the sense of, 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 despre of, of desperateness, you know, of this world. Murder here, murder there. We don't even look up. And all of this is so ordinary now that we do not pay attention. It has to be something horrible for us to even care. Murder, rape, stealing, lying has become ordinary. And what the devil has done is that he has worked systematically, listen, has worked systematically so that we don't even notice anymore that we are living in the days Jesus just described. You know, most of our young people were born into this. That, that's all they have ever known. And so, where, where, where we should see Jesus through the stones of life, we don't even notice that he's there. And this is Jesus talking. And I'm not talking about the, the words of Paul, which are very graphic, or the words of the other prophets. But just in case you didn't get the word of Jesus, the Holy Spirit left a bomb in the book of Daniel, the 12th chapter. Where he says in Daniel 12 and verse 1, and at that time, Michael shall stand up, that great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. You cannot get more cataclysmic than this. It's going to be worse than you have ever heard. Worse than you can ever imagine. And, and this is the norm that little Jalen will grow up in. And if Darren and, 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 and Shadi do not alert those precious children that this is not a norm with God. It is a norm here on earth. But we are not normal here. 
Our planet is an abnormality to the universe. If we don't teach our children, then our children are going to think that this is okay when it is not. And God intended that when the stones of life starts coming, you see Jesus high and lifted up. So Jesus said in Luke 21, 28, now when these things happen, begin to happen, what? Come on, say it. Look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. You see, you have to see Jesus through the stones of, through the stones of life. We just turn off the news and go to sleep, missing the, the, the see Jesus moment. You know, I, I, folks, I have such a burden for you today. You, you see, when you grab a child like Jalen in your hands, and you say, Lord, you have given me a responsibility to rear this child in this crazy world. Think about it, folks. See, what I'm trying to tell you is that the atmosphere of the last days is going to be filled with stones thrown at the heads of God's people. We're going to really believe the text that we love to quote in Jeremiah 29 where it says, For I know the thoughts that, you think toward, that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of what? Come on, say it. Thoughts of what? And not of evil. To give you a future and a what? Here's what we may not actually notice about this text. You know, the prophet Jeremiah is writing to people who are exiles in Babylon. And God is saying through the prophet, while you are in Babylon and cannot seem to get out, don't think my thoughts towards you are evil. While the stones of life are coming, don't question my aim. You see, even the babies say amen. That's a shame. Huh? Come on, adults, wake up. And, and that's what God is saying here. How does it apply to you then? Oh, let, let's bring it here. You see, Stephen's story is well known to many Christians, right? There's really uh, very little that we know about him before we get to Acts chapter 6. Um, and, and, and the Bible commentary actually gives us uh, some insight about who he is. It is said in tradition that Stephen and Philip were both of the 70. And, and that was very interesting to me. Now, if you don't know who the 70 were, go back to Matthew 10 or Luke 10. You recall early in, in, the, in Christ's ministry, he anointed 70, not 12. And tradition says that Stephen and Philip, two of the deacons, were in that group. The book Acts of the Apostles, page uh, 97, it says, Stephen, the foremost of the seven deacons, was a man of deep piety and broad faith. Though a Jew by birth, he spoke the Greek language and he was familiar with the customs and manners of the Greeks. He ably defended the truths, the, the, the truth that he advocated, and utterly, <laughs> this man was off the hook, utterly defeated his opponents just by talking. Right? There's more. Because the priests and rulers could not prevail against the clear, calm wisdom of, of Stephen. They determined to make him a what? An example. And while thus satisfying their revengeful hatred, they would prevent others huh, through fear from adopting his belief. And when you think about what, we, you, know, what you just read, there's a lot, of, there's a lot to think there. Friends, here and at home, 
I need you to listen to me just for a few moments. Here's a good man, Stephen. And if tradition is correct, and he is part of the 70, then that means that he was personally instructed by Christ himself in missionary work. He actually had walked and talked with the master. He probably had shaken hands with the master. That means that Stephen was an asset to the church. Bilingual like me, comfortable in the two of the main cultures of the Roman Empire, deeply versed in Jewish history. I mean, all you got to do is, is look at the sermon in Acts chapter 7. He is eloquent. He is described in Acts chapter 6 as one of those who was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. He was so respected that he was chosen in the face of the churches first almost split to be a bridge between Jews and Greeks. And in many early days of the church, after my baptism, and when I started evangelism, I would always ask myself, why would God allow a man like this to be stoned. And this is what this sermon is all about. To move you from a certain kind of comfort zone that a lot of us have. And to help you understand this sermon. That in these last days, Jesus will stop be predictable. You see, I'm convinced that God cannot take us to the kingdom until you and I become totally submissive to whatever he does, whenever he does it, the way that he does it, when he does it, and how he does it without asking us a question. And a lot of us who have gone actually through the trauma and, tra and tragedy uh, uh, you know, in the church over the past three years, we are, we are wrestling, we are, we are fighting. See, in the beginning of the year, I lost my friend Bruce. I lost two years ago, almost two years ago, I lost my military buddy, uh, Michelangelo. At the, he was 54. Now my wife has lupus. My son has autism. But, but, but Lord, we are praying people. We are tithe-paying tithe people. We serve the Lord in his random church. Why does God allow this to happen? Because God will not take anybody to the kingdom who tries to be God in place of him. That includes ordering him around with our prayers. He has the right to be God in any way that he wants to be God. And the day he cannot be, then he is not your God. You have another God. Folks, if you, have, if you would have visited the early church and looked at the people brought in, they, they, they needed Stephen. They, they needed Stephen as long as possible. And, 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 and I, I mean, keep Stephen alive. Lord, he can preach. He can teach. He's eloquent. He's charismatic. But he barely lasted a year. You know, one of the lessons that you learn by studying the cross is the amazing methodology of God. A God who can create a son, S-U-N, with a thought, saves humanity hanging on a cross. Can you please explain that one to me? A God that has the power, the power to do anything, any way he wants, saves humanity by making himself Fully helpless. 
And Mario, you think you can order that God around and decide how he is going to do things and what he's going to do? No, sir. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Higher than the heaven is above earth are my ways. So please, Mario, let me be God. Be fully submissive to my will. Yes, you're going to lose your health. Some of your prayer, prayers will not be answered. Your wife is going to have lupus. Some of your church members will get fire over the Sabbath. It will happen, and I am still God. This is not an easy sermon. I mean, why should my wife get lupus? She's serving the Lord. She loves you, Lord. And God says, excuse me, Mario, I don't give wise. I give love. I am a decision maker, not a debater. And I know that some of you are having difficulties with this sermon because you spent your life trying to put God in this box. We talk about this good God. What do you mean good? First of all, we don't even know what good is. And the only measurement of good is God. And he doesn't act like we act. So what are we talking about? Good. You see, we cannot say there's none good but God and then impose on him our definition of good. He is God. He is the definition of good. Isaiah 46 and verse 9, For I am God and there's none other. I am God and there's none like me. Prayer from good people will appear not to be answered in these last days. Healthy people will get cancer. People who marry someone in the church will have as bad of marriage as someone who marries outside the church. Seven-day Adventists will lose their job over the Sabbath. No matter how much they pray or no matter how much the whole church is praying, some of our children will get hooked on drugs. And when the storms blow, Christian houses will blow down just like everybody else. But in the midst of the storms of life, your temptation will be to doubt whether doing God's will has any benefit at all. And the minute you do that, the devil has you. And folks, some of us are letting our our brains become bait for the devil in these last days. We are fighting. We are, and I'm saying we. We are fighting over stuff and arguing with God about stuff. And all he's doing, all he's doing is trying to get to the point where you recognize that the God we serve must be God his way. Don't just God by accidents. Just God by his character. Trust God in his promises. The dead in Christ will rise first. There shall be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. Believe it. Take him at his word and, or, or do something else. But do not. I repeat, do not try to push God into a corner. He refuses to be there. He has been God too long. By the way, this sermon is for me. The most unsubmissive person God has ever saved. I love arguing with God. And I have, I have been doing it as I look at my wife in pain. And what I'm realizing is how powerful God is with his mouth shut. Have you noticed that? How loud his silence is? 
You are full of questions, on your knees, begging, pleading, banging on the bed. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. By, but, but his silence is loud and powerful. And I realized a long time ago that when, when Nanette was actually diagnosed with thyroid cancer, that if God explained it, I could not get it. I will not understand it. Because all I do is sit there and ask more questions and more inquisitions because I cannot see. Remember, he said higher. Higher than the heavens is his viewpoint. His viewpoint seems, sees time from beginning to the end. How are you going to discuss with him why he allows so and so and so and so when his viewpoint sees the end from the beginning? Let me put it this way. If I saw what was coming in the future, it will scare me half to death. You will not get up in the morning. Hmm? Oh, Mario is going to herniate a disc on his back that will create so much pain that he cannot sleep on June 9th. Guess who's not getting out of the house on June 9th? I am not moving from the bed. You see, but what you and I don't realize is that my herniated disc is going to save my soul. So God is not going to discuss nothing with you. He's going to allow the rock to come, and when it hits your head, he wants you to say, I see Jesus. High and lifted up, standing by the throne of God. Hmm? You know, when I was laying in the, in the MRI machine, it, 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 you know, to find out what was really going on with me, I preached that morning. It, it, you know, Kathleen and, and, I, and me were talking about this. I was crazy to do what I was doing. Any accident, any wrong move, I would be paralyzed. In a moment, in seconds. Some of you did not notice that I have a TENS unit on to redirect pain. They showed, that, they showed us that in the military. You know? And, and I, I could not take any medication that day. No narcotics that day. Motrin could not help me because it was nerve pain. And I could not take my nerve pain because it would make me drowsy and I was driving by myself. And all I could think about was Isaiah 43. Because Isaiah 43 starts with the words that we love. Verse 1 says, But now, thus saith the Lord, huh, who created you, O Jacob, and who formed you, O Israel, fear not. I have redeemed you, and I have called you by your name. You are mine. Somebody ought to say amen. I am his. Lying there in pain. Lord, I'm yours. Then I'm, I'm actually going over verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. And shall not, shall no flame scorch you. Hallelujah! And, and that's how the chapter starts, right? But the verse that made, you know, that, that, that made so much power to me in the middle of that MRI... That I shouted, Jesus, help me. And caused a Muslim technician to come to the microphone of the MRI machine and said, Amen. Amen. 
It was verses 18 and 19. Do not remember the former things, Mario, nor consider the things of all. Behold, I will do a new thing. You see, when someone sees Jesus while the stones are coming at his head, that's a new thing. Huh? Don't, 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 don't look for me to operate the same way. Not in the last days. I'm going to do a new thing. And I will even make a road in the wilderness <laughs> and a river in the desert. Why are you so quiet? Praise God. Lord, you told me a new thing. Huh? That's why I said, Jesus, help me. Yes, Mario, I'm about to show you what I can do when your back is not worth a dime. A new thing. I'm going to show off in your misery a new thing. And I'm going to have you glorify my name while the blood is coming out of the side of your head. A new thing. In fact, Mario, I'm not going to stop the stones. I'm going to manifest myself while the stones of life are coming at you. And even after they hit you, you're going to say, I see Jesus. You see, some people stop at the stoning of Stephen. Most of the people do not understand the entire story of Stephen. They, or or they, they actually read too fast to realize that the chapter ends and he fell asleep. Hey, I'm not ready. I'm not ready yet, Mr. Barrow. Ms. Ms. Barrow, I'm not ready. I'm only warming up. It doesn't say that he died. I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not ready. Trust me, I'm not ready. It doesn't say that he died from the stone. It says that he fell asleep. He went to sleep while the stones were coming on his head. He felt peace in Jesus. No rock killed him. In the midst of the stones, he submitted fully. And the Lord just took him. The Lord just took him. Isn't God awesome? You know, Job tells you that, 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 that God's actions are not always connected to, you know, to your life's walk. They are connected to your life's needs. So God did nothing for Stephen. He did nothing to stop a good man, a Holy Spirit-filled man. And you can believe that when he was before the Sanhedrin, the whole church was praying. Peter was praying, John was praying, the apostles were praying, Philip was praying, the elders were praying, the newly elected deacons were praying, but God did nothing that they could see. And the last thing they expected was that this good man who had preached to them the Sabbath before would die. Let me ask you a question. Can you imagine the pain one goes through by being stoned to death? You see, each stone is pain. And finally, as the stones keep coming, you reach the point where you are praying for the stone, for a stone to hit your head. You're praying for the stone of death. And the church is praying on their knees while the stones are flying towards Stephen. And it, it, it looks like God was totally absent. And suddenly, in the midst of them chewing at him like animals, Stephen says, I have a vision. I don't have time for pain right now. And he claimed, you know, he, he, he literally called out loud, I see Jesus. I am lifted up, standing on the right hand of God. And then to show you that he was connected with Jesus. He used the same words the Savior used, where he said, Father, 
forgive them for they know not what they do. Verse 6, he says, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. <laughs> you see, when you see Jesus, you have no animosity. When you see Jesus, you have no regrets. When you see Jesus, you have no revenge. Don't charge them with this sin, Jesus. Then he knelt. He says it there. He bowed down. Stones were still coming. He bowed down while their stones were taking him. And then he just went to sleep. So my question to you is this. What do you do when the stones of life are coming at your head? You've been coming lately, but you come to church and you talk to people trying to put this strong front while deep down inside you are broken. Broken. Happy Sabbath, but it's killing you inside. The stones are too much. It reminds me of the story of a minister that was passing through his church in the middle of the day and decided to pause by the altar and, and see who had come to the church. Just then, the back door opened and a man came down, uh, you, you, know, to, uh, you know, came down the aisle. The minister frowned as he saw the man that, that they haven't shaved for a while. His shirt was kind of ragged. His coat was dirty. The man knelt down. He bowed down his head, then rose and walked away. In the days that follow, each noontime came this man. Each time he knelt for a moment, you know, at lunchtime, right? And took off and disappeared. So the minister was suspicious. You know, with robbery, uh, you know, the, was the main fear. Uh, he decided to stop the man and ask, what are you doing here? And the old man said, well, I, I worked down the road, and, and, and lunch, lunch was it's only a half hour. Lunch time was his prayer time, you know, for finding faith, strength, and power. And, and I, I, just, I just stay only a moment, you, you see, because the factory is so far away. As I kneel here, I, I'm talking to the Lord, and this is what I say. I just came, to, I just came again to tell you, Lord, how happy I have been since we found each other's friendship and you took my sins away. Don't know much how to pray, but I think about you every day. So Jesus, this is Jim, just checking in. The minister, feeling foolish, told Jim, you know what, come anytime you want. He told the man he was welcome to come and pray anytime. Oh, time to go, Jim smiled and said, thank you, and then hurried out the door. The minister down, then knelt down in that altar. He never had done that before. His cold heart melted, warmed with love. And he met there with Jesus. And as tears came streaming down his face, he repeated Jim's prayer. I just came again to tell you, Lord, how happy I have been since we found each other, each other's friendship, and you took my sins away. Don't know much about prayer, but I think about you every day. So Jesus, this is me, just checking in. Past noon one day, the minister noticed that old Jim had not come. And more days had passed, no sign of Jim. He began to worry. And at the factory, he asked about Jim, and he learned that he was ill. The hospital staff was worried, but Jim had given them a thrill. See, the week that Jim was with them, he brought change in that ward. He smiled, and it was contagious. Changed people were his reward. 
The head nurse could not understand why Jim was so glad. No flowers, no cards, no, 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 no visitor. The minister stayed with, by Jim's bed. He, he, he voiced the nurse's concern. No friend came to show they care. He had nowhere to turn. Looking surprised, old Jim spoke up <laughs> with his winsome smile. The nurse is wrong. She could not know that in here, all the while that I've been here, every day at noon, he's here. A dear friend of mine, you see, he sits right there. He takes my hand. He leans over and says to me, I just came again to tell you, Jim, how happy I have been since we found this wonderful friendship and I took away your sin. I always love to hear you pray and I think about you every day. And so, Jim, this is Jesus checking in. So while your pastor argue with Jesus. Jesus came to my office and checked in. And he said, Mario, for once in your life, let me be God. Your wife, I got her. Your son, he's mine. Your daughters, I love them and they belong to me. Your son Stephen, I know where he is. But in the meantime, do you see me, Mario? Do you see me high and lifted up, preparing a place for you? And right there and then, your pastor had to say, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. And I wonder today, how many here and at home have been afflicted by the stones of life? Regardless of how young or old you are, you have been afflicted. How many of you are broken right now because the stones don't seem to stop? How many of you are at the brink of giving up because there's too much pain. I'm just wondering. Here and at home. And maybe perhaps. We should have a Stephen moment. You need prayer for strength. You need prayer for the faith of Stephen in your life. You need prayer for the Holy Spirit to fill your life. So when the stones come, or for you to, you know, or, 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 or you know, they have come, they're there right now. And for you to deal with the stones that are coming right now, all you do, all you're going to say is, Lord, I see Jesus. I am lifted up. And I wonder, just wonder, who needs that kind of prayer today here? Prayer for strength. Prayer for faith. Or prayer for an infilling of, your Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit in your life. If that is you, I ask that you get up and come to where I am so we can pray for those three things. Who will come? Just come. 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 Just come. Just come. You're at home, you can get up. 
You can just stand right there and Jesus sees you. Just come. Just come. Father in heaven, forgive my unbelief. Forgive my arguments. Forgive my questions. Father, we are coming for strength. We are coming because, Lord, we need faith now more than ever. But, Lord, we're also coming because we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need a Stephen moment in our lives today. Lord, there's too many rocks. And they don't seem to stop. But through the middle of those stones, let us look up, Lord, and say, I see Jesus. I see Jesus high and lifted up, standing at the right hand of, my, of the Father. We have a high priest that is covering us with his righteousness if we just take it. Father, let us walk out of this sanctuary different with our head held on high because just right now in our minds oh we can see you Jesus we can see you and you can see us so Father right now whatever stones if you decided for them to stay there so be it but if there's a way Lord that you can just take some down we love you. We love you, Jesus. And we are in desperate need of your second coming. So, Father, until then, as the devil throws the stones at us, let us see Jesus through the stones. Thank you, Lord, because we're going to walk out of this place full of life, full of strength, full of faith, Knowing and claiming that we have the Holy Spirit in us. And this I pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And God's people say, Amen and Amen. You may be seated.